Father, we thank you that we have time. We make time to be with you and to hear your voice. Help us to understand the spirit of prophecy and the Bible. Are you speaking to us? May we hear and may we understand. May we move with everything you tell us. We know that we will be prepared because you have made us to be prepared. We thank you now. Amen. We are in chapter 4 of Daniel. In verse 11, it says the truth grew and was strong. So let's see what that's about. In Prophets and Kings, page 515, it says, In mercy, God gave the king another dream to warn him of his peril and of the snare that had been laid for his ruin. This, of course, is after he got through that golden statue thing. He went backwards instead of forward. It is not surprising that the successful monarch, so ambitious and so proud spirit, should be tempted to turn aside from the path of humility, which alone leads to true greatness. In the intervals between his wars of conquest, he gave much thought to the strengthening and beautifying of his capital, until at length the city of Babylon became the chief glory of his kingdom. His passion as a builder and his signal success in maybe making Babylon one of the wonders of the world ministered to his pride until he was in grave danger of spoiling his record as a wise ruler whom God could continue to use as an instrument for the carrying out of the divine purpose. In Testimonies, Volume 8, page 126, studying Nebuchadnezzar's dream as recorded in the fourth chapter of Daniel, the king saw his prosperity, and because of it he was lifted up, notwithstanding the warnings that God had given him, he did the very things which the Lord had told him not to do. <laughs> the king's reason was taken away. The judgment that he had thought so perfect, the wisdom he had prided himself on possessing, were removed. The jewel of the mind, that which elevates man above the beasts, he no longer retained. What a shock that must have been to him when he began losing his mind. And he, he could tell he couldn't think anymore. I mean, this is horrible. He turned into an animal. The mighty ruler is a maniac. <laughs> Let men become lifted up in pride, and the Lord will not sustain them and keep them from falling. Let a church become proud and boastful, not depending on God, not exalting his power, and that church will surely be left by the Lord. Now, I wonder how many of us have read that and applied it to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It says here God will leave that church. That church will be brought down to the ground. Let a, a people glory in wealth, intellect, knowledge, or anything but Christ, and they will soon be brought to confusion. Now, she talks about Daniel here. She's talking about Babylon. But she brings the church into it. Now, what church do you think she's talking about? She's not talking about the churches who the Bible says are all gone. She's talking about the church that's happy, it's wealthy, and has intellect and all the rest of it. Confusion. Well, confusion is another name for Babylon. Did you see that? We don't call the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon yet. But she says, confusion, that's where it's headed. Now, we're talking about Daniel, that's 600 years before Christ, and then another 2,000 years to us. But already she's talking about us. How do we miss these things? Review and Herald, March 28, 1907. 
the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. All kings, all nations are his under his rule and government. His resources are infinite. Those upon whose actions hang the destinies of nations are watched over with a vigilance that knows no relaxation by him who giveth salvation unto kings, to whom belong the shields of the earth. So God is in control of everything, including the kings. Prophets and kings, page 521. The once proud monarch had become a humble child of God. The tyrannical, overbearing ruler, a wise and compassionate king, he who had defied and blasphemed the God of heaven now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly wrought to promote the fear of Jehovah, not Yahweh. Alan White never uses the word Yahweh. We ought to pay attention to that. Why do our scholars always say Yahweh? It's not in the Bible, it's not in the spirit prophecy, it's not any place that, that counts. Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. Verse 17, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. Prophets and Kings 5.36 The history of nations speaks to us today, to every nation and to every individual, God has assigned a place in his great plan. We all have a place. Do you know what your place is? What has God called you to? What is your place? Today, men and nations are being tested by the plummet in the hand of him who makes no mistake. All are by their own choice deciding their destiny. And God is overruling all for the accomplishment of his purposes. So we all have a place in God's plan. Do I know what my place is? Do you know that wherever you are in any day, you're working out your plan. If you don't go where God wants you to go, you're out of his plan. You're just doing your own thing. The prophecies which the great I am has given in his word. Who is the great I am? Now, if you say anything but Jesus, you're not getting it. Jesus is the great I am. Uniting link after link in the chain of events from eternity in the past to eternity in the future. Now, how far back does eternity in the past go? Well, it goes way beyond the earth. The earth is kind of dropped in there. It goes way beyond the sun. It goes way, way, way beyond all the worlds. It goes way beyond all the angels. Eternity past goes way back. It never ends because God is there. God is there. And everything comes after him. Then comes the sun. Now there's two of them. And then creation. We've got to keep those things in their proper focus. If we don't know that God was alone, the supreme sovereign of the universe, if we don't know he was alone, we're not going to know what his son is. His son comes next. Now, we don't know how long God was alone, but he was alone. We've got to know that. There are very few people who will ever understand this. It's an amazing thing that we can pick up enough to understand it. But that gives us a proper way to move through the gospel, to see where it goes, what it does. So these things that she writes about Daniel are important. She's 
giving us clues of what God has done all the way through. In the process of the ages, what may be expected in the time to come? All that prophecy has foretold as coming to pass until the present time has been traced in the pages of history, and we may be assured that all which is yet to come will be fulfilled in its order. Today, the signs of the time declare that we are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Well, one of those great solemn events happened on Tuesday, this week. That's right. There was an election. This country will never be the same after that election, and we're still waiting for the result of two places to see where that goes, because that will have a bearing on the history of this country. It will have a bearing on Trump running for president. It will have a bearing on Biden running for president, trying to do it again. All these things are working their way out. It's all part of God's plan. No book leaflets, methods number 31, page 1. We are living in the last days of this earth's history. And we may be surprised at nothing in the line of apostasies and denials of the truth. Now, she's bringing in apostasy. Who does that apply to? The church. Unbelief has now come to be a fine art. Not just in the Sunday-keeping churches, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. All these things we read about the church apply to us which men work out to the destruction of their souls. There is constant danger of there being shams in pulpit preachers. The preachers are shams whose lives contradict the words they speak. Now, these are horrible things that we're reading. But the voice of warning and admonition will be heard as long as time shall last, and those who are guilty of transactions that should never be entered into when reproved or counseled through the Lord's appointed agencies will resist the message and refuse to be corrected. And she just said something. In the church are sham preachers. And when something comes along to correct them, she says they will refuse to be corrected. These are terrible words, but they're true words. And somebody ought to be paying attention to who this might be. They will go as Pharaoh did and Nebuchadnezzar until the Lord takes away their reason. Now, we don't have to go to the extent that Nebuchadnezzar went. He became a maniac. We can become lunatics and not know it. So every word she's saying here can be happening right now, and we don't know it. And their hearts become unimpressible. Well, when a person gets there, there's nothing more God can do for them. The Lord's word will come to them. But if they choose not to hear it, the Lord will make them responsible for their own ruin. There are millions of people doing that today. They will not listen to what God says in his word, so they're working out their own ruin. They'd rather have a church than Jesus. Yeah, even if that church teaches everything wrong. That's what Ellen White is talking about. Review and Errol, January 11th, 1906. In verse 37, it says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. In Daniel's life, the desire to glorify God was the most powerful of all motives. That was Daniel's life. He was a representative of Jesus. Are we representatives of Jesus? 
Well, if he is, the desire to glorify God is the most powerful of all things in our life. He realized that when standing in the presence of men of influence, a failure to acknowledge God as a source of his wisdom would have made him an unfaithful steward. And his constant recognition of the God of heaven before kings, princes, and statesmen detracted not one iota from his influence. King Nebuchadnezzar, before whom Daniel so often honored the name of God, was finally thoroughly converted. <laughs> That's the king of Babylon, the biggest kingdom there ever was. He was finally thoroughly converted, and he learned to praise and extol and honor the King of Heaven. So here we have at the head of the, the kingdom of Babylon, a kingdom which was once heathen all the way through. The king himself became a true Christian. Now we're not talking about just somebody that goes to church. He became a genuine Christian in the spirit of Christ. So when we think of Babylon, we've got to remember the king became a Christian. Youth Instructor, December 13, 1904. The king upon Babylon's throne became a witness for God, giving his testimony warm and eloquent from a grateful heart that was partaking of the mercy and grace, the righteousness and peace. King Nebuchadnezzar became a righteous man of the divine nature. He had the divine nature. He became a genuine Christian. He was obedient to Christ. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 298. If man abuses his entrusted treasures, God can scatter faster than man can gather. <laughs> so if a man wants to go out and earn lots of money and buy houses and different things, they can do that. But God in one night can scatter all of that so he has nothing. We ought to remember that. Man may have brilliant intellect. He may be rich in the possession of natural endowments, but these are all given him by God, his maker. That's Jesus. When she says God and then she says his maker, that's Jesus. God can remove the gift of reason. And in a moment, man will become as Nebuchadnezzar degraded to the level of the beasts of the field. Now, we don't stop to think what all these things mean, but why do so many people drink liquor, alcohol? That comes from Satan. God did not create liquor. Satan invented it. He put it into man's way, and the people who use it go insane. They may not think they're insane, but they are insane. They'll ruin their life, and they'll ruin the life of everybody around them. They become beasts. They are like Nebuchadnezzar. I'll go back to reading here. He can remove the gift of reason, and in a moment man will become as Nebuchadnezzar, degraded to the level of the beasts of the field. This God does because man acts as though his wisdom and power have been gotten independently of him. So this world is in a terrible mess. We have beasts, animals wandering all around. They do their work, then they go someplace and they drink themselves and their families into some kind of a terrible thing. The men beat up their wives because they're bigger. There's divorces. There's families living apart. That's a big mess. And it's not, nothing natural about it. It all comes from Satan. If we didn't have alcohol, this would be a different world. Prophets and Kings, page 521. The once 
proud monarch had become a humble child of God. Now, how does a king of the biggest kingdom on the earth, how does he act as a humble child of God? <laughs> He's still a king. The tyrannical, overbearing ruler, a wise and compassionate king. He who had defied and blasphemed the God of heaven now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly sought to promote the fear of Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. Under the rebuke of him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, Nebuchadnezzar had learned at last the lesson which all rulers need to learn, that true greatness consists in true goodness. God's purpose, that the greatest kingdom in the world should show forth his praise, was now fulfilled. The greatest kingdom on the earth. This public proclamation in which Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the mercy and goodness and authority of God was the last act of his life recorded in sacred history. So he stayed that way. He stayed that way. He was made into a real Christian. He served Jesus in his righteousness. And that's how he must have died. Chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. Uh, through the folly and weakness of Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that's an interesting statement because the Bible does not call him his grandson. The Bible calls him his son. But there was another man in between. <laughs> Proud Babylon was soon to fall. Admitted in his youth to a share in kingly authority, Belshazzar gloried in his power and lifted up his heart against the God of heaven. Many had been his opportunities to know the divine will and to understand his responsibility and rendering obedience thereto. He had many opportunities to learn obedience to God. Well, if that evil king had the opportunities to learn obedience to Christ, have we had the same opportunities? I think so. We all have had an opportunity to learn. We're supposed to obey God. Obedience is the only reason that we get to go to heaven. It's not because Jesus died. It's not because we were justified. The only reason we will go to heaven is if we learn obedience. Now, I don't know how to say that to any other church, but this church has it in the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> obedience to Christ. But although it's in our books, it's not in the people. Nobody believes Obedience is our ticket to heaven. They believe in righteousness by faith. So long as they believe Jesus died on the cross, he took care of it. No, that's not in the Bible. But Belshazzar allowed the love of pleasure and self-glorification to efface the lessons that he should never have forgotten. He wasted the opportunities graciously granted him and neglected to use the means within his reach for becoming more fully acquainted with truth. Well, I don't think he's the only one that's wasted the opportunity. With reason dethroned through shameless intoxication and the lower impulses and passions, now in the ascendancy, the king himself took the lead in the riotous argument. Testimonies to Ministers, page 434. It is a truth which should make every one of us weep, those living in these last days, upon whom the ends of the world are come, are far more guilty than was Belshazzar. So today, everywhere in this world, we have people that are more guilty than that king. 
This is possible in many ways. Shall the sacred vessel, whom God is to use for high and holy work, be dragged from its lofty controlling sphere to administer to debasing lust? Is not this idol worship of the most degrading kind, the lips uttering praises and adoring a sinful human being? What is she talking about here? pouring forth expressions of ravishing tenderness and adulation which belong alone to God. Well, this is what all the love storybooks talk about. A man ravishing a woman. A man saying all these wonderful tender things to her. Saying all the adoring things to her and the woman doing the same to him, when all those words belong only to God. Testimonies to Ministers 435, when engaged in man and woman worship. There it is. Men are actually worshiping a woman, and a woman a man. Remember that there is the same witness present as at the feast of Belshazzar. So no one's going to get away with it. That is idol worship. And it's going to be brought up in front of God, and these people will know it. Then was Belshazzar greatly troubled. So what happened that made him troubled while he was in the midst of this? A watcher who was unrecognized, but whose presence was a power of condemnation looked on this scene of profanation. Soon the unseen and uninvited guest made his presence felt. At the moment when the sacrilegious revelry was at its height, a bloodless hand came forth and wrote words of doom on the wall of the banqueting hall. Burn it. Words followed the movement of the hand. Mene, mene taka befarsin was written in letters of flame. Few were the characters traced by that hand on the wall facing the king, but they showed that the power of God was there. Belshazzar was afraid. His conscience was awakened. The fear and suspicion that always follow the course of the guilty seized him. When God makes men fear, they cannot hide the intensity of their terror. Alarm seized the great men of the kingdom, their blasphemous disrespect of sacred things was changed in a moment. A frantic terror overcame all self-control. In vain, the king tried to read the burning letters. He had found a power too strong for him. He could not read the writing. Medical Ministry, page 151. Christian... Physicians need to pray, to watch under prayer. Before them is opened a door for many temptations, and they need to be awakened to a lively sense that there is a watcher by their side. As surely as I was a watcher at the sacrilegious feast of Belshazzar. Now that's just a little aside that Ellen White says. Physicians have many temptations. And if they give in to those temptations, there's a watcher making a record. 27. Tekel. What's that word mean? Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Consuls of Stewardship, page 142. As we deal with our fellow men in petty dishonesty or in more daring fraud, so will we deal with God. Men who persist in a course of dishonesty will carry out their principles until they cheat their own souls and lose heaven and eternal life. You see, that's the opposite of obedience. Honesty should stamp every action of our lives. Heavenly angels examine the work that is put into our hands, and where there has been a departure from the principles of truth, wanting is written in the records. Counsels to Teachers, 348. 
After the meeting, the remainder of the day was spent by the students in various games and sports, some of which were frivolous, rude, and grotesque. I was shown that in the amusements carried on at the school that afternoon, the enemy gained a victory and teachers were weighed in the balances and found wanting. Is that happening today? I could tell you stories of what's happened in some of the schools I have seen. And the people there don't seem to recognize wanting. That's just recorded for them. Early writings, page 37. Then I was shown a company who were howling in agony. On their garments was written in large characters, Thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. What, what, what is this balance? It's the sanctuary. We will be weighed by the sanctuary balances. I asked who this company were. The angel said, These are they who once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. So there are people all over this world who have kept the Sabbath and finally gave it up. Yes, these people are no longer Seventh-day Adventists. But how many in the church are like that? We don't know. The Great Controversy, page 491. While the man of business is absorbed in the pursuit of gain, while the pleasure lover is seeking indulgence, while the daughter of fashion is arranging her adornments, it may be in that hour that the judge of all the earth will pronounce the sentence. Medical Ministry, page 164. Our health institutions are of value in the Lord's estimation only when he is allowed to preside in their management. If his plans and devisings are regarded as inferior to the plans of men, he looks upon these institutions as of no more value than the institutions that are established and conducted by worldlings. God cannot endorse any institution unless it teaches the living principles of his law and brings its own actions into strict conformity to these precepts. Upon these institutions that are not maintained according to his law, he pronounces the sentence unaccepted. We're dealing with chapter 5. Uh, we're on verse 27. Those who are do-nothings now will have the superscription upon them. They knew their master's will. Who is our master? That's Jesus. But did it not? They had the light of truth. They had every advantage, but they chose their own selfish interests, and they will be left with those with whom they did not try to save. A book has been given us to guide our feet through the perils of this dark world to heaven. A book? What book is that? Well, we all say, well, that's the Bible. Is there a book that's called the Bible? <laughs> yes, there is. And it's not 80 different Bibles. They are not a book. It tells us how we can escape the wrath of God. By the way, is there such a thing as the wrath of God? I'm reading a book right now where the fellow says, well, God could never do this and God could never do that to his son because that's not in him. <laughs> Well, it's not the natural order of things, but God does have wrath. And it also tells the sufferings of Christ for us. And if any come short at last, having heard the truth as I have in this land of light, it will be their own fault. They will be without excuse. The word of God, the word of God, there's only one of those tells us how we may become perfect Christians. Now, who believes they will ever become a perfect Christian? 
they don't believe they'll become perfect anything and escape the seven last plagues, but they took no interest to find this out. Other things diverted the mind. Idols were cherished by them, and God's holy word was neglected and slighted. The word which they have neglected for foolish storybooks tries their lives. That is the standard, their motives, words, works, and the manner in which they use their time are all compared with the written word of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, 247. Many of those who have had special light are so conformed to the world that they can scarcely be distinguished from worldlings. They do not stand forth as God's peculiar people, chosen and precious. It is difficult to discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. I don't think we know anymore what God's peculiar people look like. In the balances of the sanctuary, there she says it, sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. The people in the Adventist church now, that does not say Sunday keepers. That's the people in the Adventist church. Prophets and Kings 531. More than a century before, inspiration had foretold that the night of pleasure, during which king counselors would vie with one another in blasphemy against God, would suddenly be changed into a season of fear and destruction. And now, in rapid succession, momentous events followed one another exactly as been, had been portrayed in the prophetic scriptures years before the principles of the drama had been born. Even while he and his nobles were drinking from the sacred vessels of Jehovah and praising their gods of silver and of gold, the Medes, and the Persians, having turned the Euphrates out of its channel, were marching into the heart of the unguarded city. We're now to chapter 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, and over these three presidents. So there's the king, and there's three presidents, and all these princes underneath. And then she says in the Bible, Daniel was the first president. So it was Darius, Daniel, two presidents, and then all the princes. <laughs> Daniel was that high. Prophets and Kings 539. When Darius the Median took the throne, formerly occupied by the Babylonian rulers, he at once proceeded to reorganize the government. Youth Instructor, November 1, 1900. Daniel's position was not an enviable one. <laughs> here, here is the king, and here is Daniel above the whole kingdom. And she says that was not an enviable position. He stood at the head of a dishonest, prevaricating, godless cabinet whose members watched him with keen, jealous eyes to find some flaw in his conduct. They kept spies on his track to see if they could not in this way find something against him. Satan suggested to these men Satan suggested to these men a plan whereby they might get rid of Daniel, <laughs> use his religion as a means of condemning him, the enemy said. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 295. Satan leads many to believe that prayer to God is useless and but a form. He well knows how needful our meditation and prayer to keep Christ's followers aroused to resist his cunning and deception. Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him. 
fallen angels feared that his influence would have weakened their control over the rulers of the kingdom. For Daniel was high in command. The accusing host of evil angels stirred up the presidents and princes to envy and jealousy, and they watched Daniel closely to find some occasion against him. Education 56. Throughout the reign of successive monarchs, the downfall of the nation, and the establishment of a rival kingdom, such were his wisdom and statesmanship, so perfect his tact, his courtesy, his genuine goodness of heart, combined with fidelity to principle, that even his enemies were forced to the confession they could find no occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. <laughs> So all the leaders of these kingdoms knew who Daniel was. Prophets and Kings 546. The experience of Daniel as a statesman in the kingdoms of Babylon and Medio Persia reveals the truth that a businessman is not necessarily a designing policy man, but that he may be a man instructed by God at every step a man of like passions as ourselves. The pen of inspiration describes him as without fault, his business transactions and subjectives to the closest scrutiny of his enemies were found to be without one flaw. He was an example of what every businessman may become when his heart is converted and consecrated and when his motives are right in the sight of God. Verse 10, it says, When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day, as he did a fourth time. Now, we talked about kneeling before. That is the way to be when we are worshiping God. There's no other way. So here we have him on his knees praying three times a day. Well, that's easy to figure out when he woke up in the middle of the day and when he went to bed. But he did that every day. Gospel Workers, page 178. Both in public and private worship, it is our privilege to bow on our knees before the Lord when we offer our petitions to him. Testimonies, Volume 4, page 569. Daniel was an intellectual giant. Well, we should think about that time. How do you become an intellectual giant? He was an intellectual giant. Yet, he was continually seeking for greater knowledge, for higher attainment. Other young men had the same advantages, but they did not like him, Bald, bend all their energies to seek wisdom. The knowledge of God is revealed in his word and in his works. Although Daniel was one of the world's great men, he was not proud nor self-sufficient. He felt the need of refreshing his soul with prayer and every day found him in earnest supplication before God. Daniel loved, feared, and obeyed God. There it is. He feared, he loved, and obeyed God, yet he did not flee away from the world to avoid its corrupting influence. Daniel was true, noble, and generous. While he was anxious to be at peace with all men, he would not permit any power to turn him aside from the path of duty. He was willing to obey those who had rule over him as far as he could do so consistently with truth and righteousness. But kings and decrees could not make him swerve from his allegiance to the king of kings. Daniel was a great intellect. Well, we read before, in proportion to his spirituality, his mind would grow, his intellect. So we know how he got there. He was a spiritual man. 
Father, we thank you for these glimpses into the life of Daniel. We see that he was a great man. But we see how he got there. He was a spiritual man. Teach us. Help us how to become like Daniel. He was not alone in this world. As men and women are spiritual, in proportion to that spirituality, they will become intellectual. Help us to become like them. 